Hello, everybody, and welcome to Learn With The Expert. We're so excited to have you join us tonight. As we are waiting for everyone to join, we would love for you to introduce yourself in the chat, share where you're from, your role, and your grade level. The chat is located on the right-hand side of your screen, and if you don't see it, look at the bottom right corner of the chat for the chat icon and just tap it to open it up. Did you know that next week is Computer Science Education Week? December 5th through 9th, classrooms will inspire K through 12 students all over the US to take interest in computer science. We're so excited to have our expert today, Jacob, who will share accessible ways that we can provide equitable STEAM instruction and the impact his strategies have had on youth that he works with. So seeing that next week is computer science week and computer science is an important part of STEAM instruction, we will end by sharing some resources from Seesaw that will support you to apply Jacob's strategies to make your instruction more personally relevant, inspiring and impactful. So let's see who we have with us. Hi, Ellen from Massachusetts, welcome. Looks like we have Stacy joining us from Modesto, California. So California, Jacob, around in your neck of the woods. <laughs> Hi, Tyler from Singapore. All right, Tyler is a STEAM teacher at the Canadian International School. Hello, Emily. Welcome, welcome. We're so excited to have you. Hi, Jen. Hello, Rosa. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Craig. We have another person from Shanghai, Matthew. Judy, well, welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you here today. So we do have a few housekeeping items before we actually dive in. If there are any questions during our session that you would like Jacob to answer, please click on that Q&A tab and ask them there. This just ensures that we don't miss any of the questions. And if there are questions that go and answer, we will reach out to you and answer them after the webinar. All other comments, reactions, ideas, thoughts can be put in the chat so that all participants can view them. Um, just make sure that your chat and your Q&A tabs are open. Um, if they're not and you're just joining us, click on the chat icon in the lower right corner and you'll have the option to toggle between the chat, the Q&A and the handouts tab. The handouts tab includes key takeaways from today's session. This session is also being recorded and a link to the recording will um, be shared with you as well as the handout from the webinar um, in a follow-up email in about 24 to 48 hours after the session is complete. I see we had a couple other people join us. Hello, Debbie. Hello, Yumina. Uh, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. All right. So now that you all have introduced yourself, you're probably wondering who we are. <laughs> My name is Mia. I am the training and professional development specialist here at Seesaw. So I work with educators like yourself um, to show you ways to innovate um, with Seesaw in your classrooms. And I am based in Chicago, Illinois. So hello, everybody. And I am excited to introduce our expert to you. Jacob Adams is the executive director of STEM to the Future, which is a nonprofit focused on inspiring and motivating black and Latin youth to use STEAM to create the world that they want and desire. Jacob has over 10 years of experience in education where he was a Teach for America Corps member, an elementary school teacher at a Blue Ribbon School in Brownsville, Brooklyn, an elementary school teacher at an emerging school in Harlem, an instructional coach throughout Los Angeles, and an entrepreneur serving thousands of Black and Latinx youth and educators in LA County. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks, Mia. All right. So as we begin, I want us to explore a few technologies that we um, that were created to solve problems. So you may be familiar with this device that you see here. It's the pacemaker. The pacemaker was designed to regulate irregular heartbeats 
a potentially life-threatening complication. This little device that you see could be implanted in the chest to help control the heartbeat. Revolutionary technology that really saved many lives. However, there was a slight problem when this was created. When women started to receive pacemakers, doctors found that um, that it was less effective and often resulted in more complications in women than in men. Why, you may ask? Because women are typically underrepresented in uh, cardiac clinical trials. So the device was not tested um, equitably in women um, as they were in men. So it was not developed to meet the needs of the female body. So researchers actually had to go back and take all genders into account and make improvements to adjust the pacemaker. So you probably have seen this. <laughs> I know all of you probably have. This is another technology designed to make our lives easier, which is the automatic soap dispenser. So uh, without needing to touch the device and get germs all over your hands, this automatic soap dispenser um, was far more um, hygienic than actually using the faucet to turn on the water and to cleanse your hands. Yet, as automatic dispensers were installed and used more wi um, widely, some flaws were found. When someone with darker skin tones tried to use the soap dispenser, it did not work. The sensors were not developed uh, with all skin tones in mind. So future designs needed to be adjusted to work for all skin tones from the very lightest to the very darkest. Um, just like the pacemaker, which we just talked about, this technology didn't account for all users and was less uh, effective as a result. So here is one more example. This third example shows the power of designing solutions for every person, not just the average in mind. So the curb cut, which you see here, was designed to help people in wheelchairs get over a curb on the sidewalk in order to cross the street. This invention made walkways far more accessible for those in wheelchairs, and it benefited people um, not only in wheelchairs, but people on bikes and walkers and um, elderly people as well, people pushing strollers um, with bags behind them. It made it much easier uh, for those people to cross the street as well. And because of this, the curb cut effect was coined. The curb cut effect states that when you design for those furthest from the margins, you really make things better for everyone in the process. As we can see from these examples, representation in STEAM matters. When there is equity in STEAM, we're able to develop technology that solves problems important to all groups of people. And we're more likely to develop solutions that actually work for all groups of people. Equity in STEAM directly impacts what technology is being created and who it's being designed for. Equity is a big idea. It can mean a lot of things. So we would love to hear from you. In the chat, please type your response to this question. What does equity in STEAM mean to you? What does equity in STEAM mean to you? So for me personally, it's about giving all students as a former uh, educator um, in um, a, a low income, high poverty area. It's about giving my students the same access to STEAM and design opportunities as other students would have. All right.
at its foundation, equity is really about access, like I was just saying, and about opportunity and also so much more. It's about positive personal identification with STEAM, topics and skills. It's enabling students to make tangible impacts on their lives and communities. It's equipping students with the tools that they need to create new systems and solutions for the social justice issues they face now and in the future. I see some responses in the chat. It's about um, taking in all people and giving accessibility. Um, Craig said um, equal access to courses and enrichment opportunities. Ellen shared taking multiple perspectives. Jennifer said educating all kids when there are lacks of supports. You are absolutely correct. So before we actually jump in with our expert, um, a quick note about workforce development. Many states are adopting STEAM or computer science standards and curricula to ensure that students have the skills that they need for their future careers. So for many, the rationale behind this is to build the pipeline for jobs in STEAM because as jobs in STEAM increase year over year, the number of qualified candidates for those jobs are falling short. So of course, we want all students to be set up for success um, in their future careers, but we're here to say computer science in the classroom needs to go beyond just workforce development. For one, the future is way too far off to really deeply um, motivate, um, to a way to be deeply motivating students. Um, and we don't even know what jobs there will be when our students enter the workforce. So instead of focusing on an abstract future, uh, what if we focus on the now, the right now? We can connect uh, to students' inherent interests. We can spark their curiosities and creativities and help them see why STEAM and computer science skills are important for their lives and their community. Not 10 years from now, but today. So in doing so, we'll develop uh, the problem solving, communication and critical thinking skills that we know our students need to thrive in whatever career they pursue, um, even ones that probably aren't even invented yet. So this is exactly what we're going to dive into today. So how can we do this? How can we enable our students to solve the challenges that are important to them now and in their future? So our expert, Jacob, will share how he has answered this question. So we'll hear about the STEAM programs he has created to support students in learning the skills they need to start making a difference in their worlds today. So before I turn it up over to Jacob, let's learn a little bit more about our expert. So we talked um, a little bit about Jacob being, um, you know, our, the executive director of STEAM for the future. So STEAM to the future, excuse me, to the future. Um, their mission is to really inspire and motivate Black and Latinx youth to uh, use STEAM to create a world that they want and deserve, as I mentioned earlier. STEAM to the future um, creates integrated hands-on learning experiences that use science, technology, engineering, and arts and math to support students to develop solutions to real world problems such as climate change, public safety, and poverty. Youth in this program creatively develop creativity and problem solving and collaboration skills as they see how a variety of STEAM pathways can be used to create the future that we know they deserve. STEAM to the Future includes three different programs. So the first program is Planting the Seed, and they partner with schools and after-school programs who want to show students how to use STEAM to uplift themselves and their community. Next is For the Greater Good, which provides educators with vetted curriculum and professional development to implement liberatory STEAM-based learning experiences. And finally, the last program is Theory and Practice. This program is a student-led initiative where students work together to decide on and uh, execute their own projects in their communities. So we're gonna be focusing mostly, most of our time um, here on this third part of the program. But as you see, can see um, this program really speaks to the entire community. Um, Jacob will walk you through a few examples of projects that came out of this program. 
All right, so let's go ahead and learn with the expert. Today, Jacob will show us how to help students create a clear vision for the world they want and deserve. Then we'll learn how they use STEAM to develop projects that support their vision. Finally, we'll see how they connect their community organizations to implement the projects. All right, without further ado, ado now it's time for our expert, Jacob, to come on and take it away. Hello, Jacob, thank you. Hey, Mia, no, I appreciate you. Uh, yeah, Don, no, thanks for the setting the stage so nicely. And, you know, appreciate everybody for uh, being here today or so, I guess uh, tonight or in the morning, uh, depending on where y'all at. So, yeah, excited to share more about myself and um, the work we're doing at STEM to the Future. Uh, so prior to um, founding STEM to the Future, I, as Mia was saying, I was a first grade teacher. And then I was a, after that, I was a second grade teacher. And after that, I was an instructional coach. Um, so while I'm not in the classroom like traditionally anymore, uh, that's definitely why I started my journey in, in education, professionally at least. And even uh, with STEM to the Future, I still teach uh, one class a week because you know, I really enjoy teaching. I actually taught it earlier today. Uh, but I still really enjoy teaching, and it helps me actually practice these things that um, I talk about. Um, or that, you know, practice, yeah, practice these things I'm talking about tonight. And, um, you know, just help me stay in touch and in tune with, with the kids and the things they're interested in. Um, yeah, so the, my time as a, especially my time as a first grade teacher, um, definitely informs the work that, uh, that I do now and the work that we do at STEM to the Future. So I was placed at a very rigid charter school. Uh, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, uh, in New York City, if you're not familiar. So the school was like 99% black and over 95% like free or reduced lunch. Um, so you know, very under-resourced uh, neighborhood, but the school has some of the highest test scores in New York City. So like, consequently, the school got a lot of attention. It was a blue ribbon school. Like any given day, there could be like 30 or 30 or 50 people coming to observe like our best practices. Um, and I remember leaving that school and went to a, my second school and I was in professional development and the videos they're showing us on how to teach or the were the people who were across the hall from me and like who were next to me um, at the school I just came from. So the school had a lot of like that school and that network just had a lot of influence over what education looks like. Um, so, yeah, that really kind of got me pretty uh, invested in, in wanting to. Yeah, you got to be really invested uh, in education further than I was. Because um, for that school, like that, whole, that school and that model of teaching, like the whole purpose was to like get the highest test scores possible, um, and everything else was just kind of like secondary or or non-existent. Um, yeah, so you know, like I was saying, we're being seen as a model for success when we really aren't preparing kids to be people who can actually use what they're learning in ways that benefit them in the community. Um, so I was thinking, you know, if this is seen as a model, then, uh, you know, we're, we're all in trouble, like, uh, as a society, because these students are, um, you know, so definitely some of the most, like, uh, historically underrepresented youth and definitely marginalized. And whether there's issues, it could be um, climate change, um, poverty, um, yeah, community safety, like, all these issues are going to disproportionately impact uh, Black, Brown, and poor students, and yet, those students who are at a quote unquote like elite school aren't really learning how to disrupt those things. Um, so without any type of, I think, formal disruption, then we just really keep uh, repeating the status quo. So now the work we do at STEM to the Future is largely to show folks like what youth are capable of when they learn in ways that are aligned to their interests uh, and the needs of the community. So hopefully you'll be able to see that as I talk about our student layer programs, um, theory and practice. So we started theory and practice in the winter of 2020. Um, you know, a lot of us probably try to block out that time in our lives, but um, coming out of that, uh, coming out of that summer, we had like the on the national stage was the the murder of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd in LA. I know we had um, the murder of another young man like Dejan Kazee. So there was just a lot of violence um, going on in terms of like on TV or on social media. And there's also that was the first winter of COVID, which was very deadly. So it's just a lot of uh, a lot of trauma. Um, going on at that time and we were doing like professional development with teachers and feedback we were getting from them was um, that their kids were feeling like really isolated you know being that they couldn't go to school uh, in person and so we wanted to create something that would help students be able to create a connection with one another uh, and also the community and also we wanted them to be able to learn in a way where they didn't have to feel like all this 
violence and negativity and trauma that was going on outside. Like the world doesn't have, they don't, we didn't want them to get lost in that and think like the world has to be that way. We wanted them to be able to see that they can work together and come up with their own ideas for the world they wanna live and they can work together to create it. So uh, now I kind of walk through like our three phases of how we do that. So the first phase um, is creating a clear vision, uh, having students create a clear vision for the world they want and deserve. Uh, so a big part of this is giving students a space where they can like be their true selves. So like uh, Paulo Fure said, like without a sense of identity, uh, there could be no struggle. So you really want to start, we feel like you really want to start by having the kids do kind of some internal work and maybe even, uh, you know, us as teachers uh, doing that work to think about like, who, who are we? Like what, what makes us up as individuals? And also by starting, you know, the year, the unit or the program uh, through this lens, it really helps your students be able to be more mindful of, of who they are and like their different identities, both, um, both, you know, of themselves and also of their peers. Um, and you're also like communicating to the kids, like this is a place where, you know, we can dream, you know, we're able to create a different type of future, um, you know, in, in this classroom. And I think that really helps spark a certain level of joy and engagement uh, from the kids. So as an educator, it's like a really great opportunity for you to like really get, really, really get to know your students. You know, you're learning like, what is it they care about? What things do they notice uh, in the world, but having a space to talk about um, you know, how, how do they see themselves? Like these are questions that we can often not, I mean, even as adults, people often don't ask, that, ask us these questions, uh, but they're so like fundamental to who we are. So I think by having your kids, being able, able to ask your kids these questions and actually creating a space where they can figure this stuff out together, um, it, it really does wonder. So I'm gonna provide a couple of examples of what that could, of what that could look like. Um, so one activity is an identity collage. And through this, you can have your students choose, you know, maybe up to like five different ideas or things that represent them. You know, these could be words. They could, you know, could just be writing words um, decoratively. They could have drawings. They could find pictures off the internet. They could go old school and like clip things out of a magazine. Out of a magazine. They could build different things with Legos. You know, um, you have a lot of creativity to figure out the ways in which you could have them represent themselves. Um, but then from there, the students share, you know, after they've built their five different uh, representations, the students are sharing why they chose those things and they're explaining how they represent them. So as a teacher, this like really helps you learn more about your kids uh, and you know, learn about your kids and learn about how your kids see themselves. And also helps you like notice themes or pattern, uh, patterns that, must, that might be consistent, you know, across your class. So like this uh, data is very invaluable for you know, a lot of different reasons. Um, for one, it gives you insight, like I was saying, gives you insight to how your kids see themselves. And, and as your class is like talking about these different issues, uh, as you're moving forward, you can also be able to discuss how those issues like, affect different identities differently. Um, and we actually have uh, this lesson on Seesaw, which will be uh, in the chat shortly. And then our next, uh, another example of how you can help your students create a clear vision for the world they want and deserve. Um, this is an activity we do called uh, freedom dreaming. And so, and so like really the part of that, like part of the foundation of teaching really anything, but definitely like STEAM through a social justice lens, uh, is starting at a place of being imaginative. So in um, black futurism, there's this idea that basically says, if you want to change the future, uh, you have to change the present. It's like the, now, like now is the future and the present are happening like simultaneously. Um, so this free freedom dream activity activity like prompts your students to think about the present and like what could the present and future look like. Um, so we typically introduce the freedom dream activity. We usually tee it up through this lesson where we're talking about um, rights versus privileges. So we just have like different. We have like housing, uh, like housing, food education, voting, excuse me, and a couple of other um, things. And we just ask the kids, like, is this a right or a privilege? And then they have to, or should it be a right or should it be a privilege? And then the kids are basically saying what they think and then providing evidence for which is which. Um, so for us, that just like helps the students kind of contextualize and frame the things that they think everyone should have. Um, and you could also do that by asking them questions like, what things does our community need? 
What things does our community want? Uh, what does our community already have? Because you know, there's already a lot of assets that are present um, in the community. But those are like some prompted questions you could ask to get them to kind of start to tap into that, uh, to their imagination. And then the students will visualize uh, and represent the world they want to live in. So you could do this um, several different ways, but one way we do it is through having students, um, it's like through teaching audio engineering at the same time. And so we'll have the kids like record, edit, like record and edit a podcast uh, where they've already written out their freedom dreams. And then they will, so they write their freedom dreams out and then they'll record them. Uh, so I will actually play uh, an example of one real quick. Hello. I want to live in a world where it is clean, it is healthy, it is safe. Everyone is free. We stay alive. We are not in the hospital. It is fun. Everyone helps others. We are all treated equally. We are not scared. We live a happy life. We live a long life. We are not sad. Our good dreams come true. Everyone lives longer. Our lives are vibrant. We only have the good type of stress. Bye. Hello. Um, cool, yeah, so that's like one of our, our from the, one of the first times we did the, uh, Freedom Dream activity, and then even that, like you could see how the student was starting to shape like the world she wanted to live in. Um, you know, she talked a lot about people being healthy, like living long lives. So this was during um, late fall of like 2020. So it was definitely a lot of deaths happening um, with COVID at that time. I thought like you can just kind of see what was going on with her and like what was going on in the world uh, through the things she was talking about. But completing that activity, like really gives the kids the freedom to dream about like what they want to be true. And it helps you as an educator, like really get to know your students, like once again. Um, so then rather than like assuming you know what your kids are interested in, like this activity gives you like a, gives them the opportunity to uh, creatively express that. Um, yeah. So then, you know, instead of rather telling the kids like, hey, today, here's the issues that we're going to uh, tackle, kind of allows them to have more autonomy over the different types of things that they uh, want to learn about and the things they want to, um, you know, things they want to share or things they want to uh, address. Um, and similarly, just like the identity collage, like you can go back and revisit these freedom dreams throughout the year uh, just to kind of make sure that you're incorporating the different issues or topics that your kids have said they care about. Because um, we all know what it feels like. Whenever you know that someone li is listening to you and someone is like incorporating your interest into a program or a class, uh, you know, you feel like you matter and then you're going to be able to show up in a much more uh, authentic and like engaged. You're going to be more engaged. Um, yeah, so that's part one. After your students have started to create, uh, you know, this idea of the world they want to live in. Next is starting to develop uh, steam projects to support that vision. So even with the identity collage, depending how you do it. And thank you. And the um, freedom dream activity. Uh, you're already in incorporating steam in there. Um, and now you can keep building on that to help students see how they can now use STEAM to address these things that they care about and be able to use STEAM to have a real world impact. Uh, so one example I'll share is um, you know, from my environmental justice program. I should have mentioned this. We have three different theory and practice programs. One's environmental justice, one is um, coding robotics for girls, and then another one is uh, a creative design program. So in the environmental justice program, um, when we first launched it uh, back in 2020, we were exposing to students to like just different environmental topics. So we didn't even start with, well, environmental justice was just a broad, um, the broad uh, subject. So in there, we talked about things like epigenetics, which is why in her three degrees, she said she only wanted the good stress because we were talking about stress and how it can carry over from generations and uh, what that looks like. So we talked about epigenetics, we talked about air quality, water quality, uh, and food apartheid. So each week or two weeks, depending on what the subject was, we would talk about these topics and then they would do STEAM activities like aligned to it. 
Um, so at epigenetics, they, they worked on like graphic design and they were building um, uh, creating like protest flyers, things similar with air quality. Uh, water quality, I know we mailed them like water testing kits, food apartheid, we mailed them like micro green sets. Um, so while we're talking about these things, they're also getting to do these like hands-on projects that are, you know, that are aligned. Um, so after learning about the issues through over the course of the year uh, and exploring those different STEAM skills, the students collaborated and they decided how they wanted to use what they, or they collaborated to figure out how they wanted to use what they're learning to have a positive impact on the community. Um, so that was really cool because the kids, like, you know, for a couple of weeks, they're just like preparing to pitch to one another about what they want to do. Um, so one kid I know wanted to do something with theater. Another kid wanted to do something with music, I believe. And then there was a kid who wanted to start like an urban farm or a garden. Um, and so during their pitches, the kid who wanted to do, and the other kids were just kind of down to hear the pitches and then decide what they wanted to do. Um, so through, uh, through those conversations, the kid who was the most interested in the urban farm he ended up just um, like politic and really it ended up adding uh, adding like the theater and the music to his pitch as a way to say like we can actually do all these things that we're interested in uh, through an urban farm. So they all pitched and then they voted and then uh, through that like democratic process they decided to start an urban farm, um, which I had no and at that point you know we had no idea what they would um, what they would pick. So that was like the first part of that program. And then the next, after that, that program ended at that point. And so then when we picked back up a couple of months later, um, now we, we were teaching our kids urban farming. They were growing a variety of foods. We partnered with this like nutrition organization who, were, who taught our kids how to cook. Um, and through cooking, our students were like learning, like basically kind of seeing they had like a new passion. They didn't even know they would enjoy it that much. At first, it's just something they wanted to try. And so... For their community project, one of the main things they did was create a cookbook, uh, as you can, kind of, you can see, like for kids, by kids. Um, so they were, yeah. So I'll tell you a little bit more in a, in a second how they were able to make, help, you know, partner with the community to make that cookbook. Um, yeah, but I remember thinking the kids were going to cook for people for their project, but they decided to go another way. Um, I know that, that can be like one of a, a big challenge as an educator is like being on uh, you know, it's nice to know like where we're going, even when we're taught to make curriculum, you start with the end and then work backwards. Uh, and with this, you can kind of do that, but uh, you're not gonna have like a defined, you're not gonna know exactly what the end is gonna look like. Like that's up for the kids to decide. And so I think that's just like a, a mindset thing uh, to keep in mind as you're creating these more like liberatory programs. Um, yeah, so just a, I know it was a lot. I just kind of break through the break down those steps real quick of that were encapsulated in the environmental justice example. Um, so one thing you want to do is just like be able to spark the kids' interest. So that's why we did like we had the different topics only for like a week or two. So that way the kids could get like a little taste of it and then move on, get like the taste of the of the topic, and, and then also get a taste of like the steam skill. And then we would progress on to the other ones. So over the course of the, the program, they're able to try a lot of different things and then decide on like what things do we really want to focus on. Um, you know, none of us were experts in any of the stuff we were talking about. So, you know, that definitely helps with not need, I mean, with some of the stuff, but with like epigenetics, um, air quality, like we, we're, we don't really study those things. So we were just being able to gather resources and partner with folks to be able to develop that type of curriculum. Well, I say that to say, like, don't feel like you need to be an expert. You, you can find YouTube videos. You can find other resources, articles that you can share with your kids that can help them um, decide or, you know, help, help give them some context. Uh, and then from there, the next step is having, the, like I was saying, the students used to pick what topic or topics and what skills that they want to focus on and then figuring out how they can use those things to, um, you know, make a difference in the community. So one thing as a teacher, you just want to make sure that you're collecting this data that the kids are interested in and planning like check-ins with the group to figure out what things are they finding interesting so you can you know, start to plan for the future as they are expressing like the things that they really want to go deeper on. Uh, cool, so then the third and final phase is connecting with the community and grassroots organization. So um, 
you know, we started by talking about how giving the students a space to say what they're really interested in. Then we developed like the STEAM projects to help them bring their vision for the world, uh, vision for the, bring their vision to the world to life and also develop these like critical STEAM skills. And next, what we really wanna do is connect with folks in the community who are already doing the work, um, doing the work that the students are interested in. And, you know, we can work with them to help uh, just help the students be able to design whatever it is that's gonna help meet an unmet need in the community. Um, so thinking back to the environmental justice example that I mentioned, um, like I was saying, we partnered with a local organization called CLA who, who was teaching our kids how to cook. Now I think I can cook decently for other people on the team, think they can cook too, but never taught cooking and have probably no business teaching cooking. Um, so we were able to partner with an uh, organization that they, that's what they do. Um, so that's really helpful. And I know it's like not always that it's not always that simple or that easy. Um, so partnering with a community organization could also look like uh, could like you know could look like finding videos of uh, people who are doing that work. Maybe one of the parents has already has some um, interest doing that. Uh, but the, yeah, or it could just be like have a Zoom call, have someone kind of present to your kids. It doesn't always have to be uh, you know someone coming in and doing something over the whole course of the year. Um, but by working with them, by working with that organization, it really helped our kids like be able to learn from an expert. And then we also were able to take them to the farmer's market a few times where the students were surveying people, um, including other kids. And so as they were doing that, they were learning, you know, you collecting that data to help them better understand the different problems that they were trying to address and learn like what people cared about, um, which is how they decided to uh, what like recipes were in the cookbook. They were asking kids like, what type of food do they like to eat? When do they eat? Do they cook? Asking them those types of questions, collecting that data, and then they use that data to actually um, make the cookbook. Uh, and another example um, of how you can engage the community to help your students. Um, the first year we were doing this program, we had um, one of the, we had an activist talk to the robotics program, and uh, she's like a housing activist. And so for the community project for the um, robotics group, they decided to build these extensions on the robot that could deliver uh, PPE to the elders that lived in the activists' activist um, housing complex. So I think that is a, one is a really dope example of how the kids can use what they're learning to have a positive impact on the community. But it also goes to show like, we, we you know we had a housing activist talking to kids in the coding program and the kids in the coding program were still able to figure out how they could use what they were learning to help something that could seem that could be seemingly um, you know uh, not aligned. So I was saying, if you can find any folks in the in the neighborhood or in the community who are uh, doing positive work, even if it doesn't seem like it's um, a clear connection, I would say bring them in because it's also just good for the kids to see, you know, um, people who are having a positive impact in the community, and they could just use that experience and contextualize it in a way that's you know relevant to them. Um, yeah, so oops. so that's basically what I was saying here. You, have to, you, have, you can have the guest speakers. And then also, um, in terms of like collecting the data to learn more about what's going on in the neighborhood, uh, you know, you can have students collect data over the classroom. You can have them collect data with other uh, students at the school. They can have a survey they do outside of school at home. But I'd say some type of mechanism to help your students really, you could find a survey that's already made if that has data from the community. Um, which is really important for them to make sure that they're rooting, uh, rooting their work and their ideas in what in like the needs of the community. So one more example, uh, so you can kind of see this, or two more quick examples. So you can kind of see this in practice um, in our uh, clothing in our um, career design program. Our students were after surveying people at the farmers market. They were asking them like what issues they cared about. And they learned that the LGBTQ rights had the least support from the community. Uh, and so what they wanted to do was actually be able to raise awareness about the LGBTQ community. So they ended up creating a clothing brand called Little Village of Love, um, you know, with the idea of um, anybody can love anybody. And that, that should be, you know, um, and they want, yeah, anybody can love anybody and they shouldn't be judged for it. Uh, and so they ended up creating this brand. They gave a lot of their clothes away at this, um, gave a lot of their clothes away, which I'll talk about in a second, at this mutual aid event. But then they also um, created a pop-up store where they sold their clothes 
uh, over like the course of four hours, they made $800 between their clothes and their artwork. And then they decided how they want to split the money up amongst themselves. And then they uh, work together to donate the rest to like identify LGBTQ um, uh, org and, and unhoused um, and, and org serving unhoused individuals. Uh, and then they donated the rest of the money to them. So the last example is our uh, mutual aid event, which just kind of brings all these different things that we've been talking about together. Um, so I think it's a real powerful culmination for a few reasons. So one, we, in those three different programs, it allowed the, all the kids to come together and see how they can, even though their programs have different focus, they, they can still work together um, to be able to have a positive impact on the community. So I was like, for a school teacher, maybe you're, the kids in your own class may have like, y'all might have a central issue or different issues you're working on. You could have them in groups where they're doing it separately, but then there could be a way where they could come together. Uh, and work on something, or maybe if there was a teacher across the hall or another teacher at another school who was doing this type of work, it could be really powerful to be able to um, bring these groups together. So additionally, it was also a really powerful event because it provided our kids with the opportunity to like, put their ideas um, into practice. And so they created, so the robotics program created and coded a, this Lego hand sanitizer machine, um, and they built a hand washing station for unhoused folks to use before they were getting food. Um, we created a design program, design and gave away clothes to unhoused folks, uh, and the environmental justice group um, distributed food that they had grew, and they gave that to the unhoused. Um, yeah, and they also took a tour of the community we're in, which also helped, uh, that was led by the folks who did the mutual aid event. So that just helped them also be around and see other people who are using their passions to have like a positive impact, um, like a positive material impact on the community. And also, you know, like I said, help them see that they can do that. Um, at their, you know, even though they're in elementary and middle school. Uh, so yeah, next, um, I think that was a lot of stuff, a lot of different examples and that it can sound um, difficult to do. Like it sounds good, but it's like, how do we ever have the time for that? Um, you know, people don't even know where to start, but I'd say, and it's definitely taken us a few years and like iterations to get to where we're at now. So I'm gonna just share like some of the most important lessons that we've learned in developing this approach to equitable um, STEAM instruction. And also, yeah, equitable STEAM instruction. So one is just creating a space for students to share their identities, interests, and voice. Uh, I thought we talked about, uh, talked about that a lot, but it's really, really important for the students to be able to uh, express themselves and feel safe in the class because difficult conversations could come up. Um, yeah, and like one, you'll never really know the types of growth that you might see from a student. Uh, our kids had this event where they uh, basically had an event where they were teaching the community about clean air. They created these different workshops. And I was asking one kid about it afterwards. And she said, I was like, how was it, you know, running your station? She was like, at first, when people came to my game, uh, my game where I was teaching people about so, uh, pollution, I was nervous. But when they left, I felt proud. And I was like, well, why'd you feel proud? She said, I felt proud because I'm usually shy, but I, was, I took responsibility and talked to people. So it's like, I'm always amazed about other impacts you might have, like other ways the students are growing outside of the content and outside of like the STEAM uh, aspect of it. Uh, next, like integrating, integrating students' interests uh, into what you're already doing. So, um, we all like to be places where we all like to learn. I would imagine most of us, if not all of us, like to learn things that we're interested in. So as soon as your students know that you are listening to them and make, making their interests a part of the classroom, it makes a huge difference. Uh, next, just like learn and discover like with your students. Basically, you don't have to be an expert. Uh, you know, do even if it's like a STEAM skill, you could do um, you could do the uh, tutorial, like a tutorial or two, like just to learn the basics. Um, and for the content, you know, you can watch a video, read a couple of articles. But I would say don't shy away from um, don't shy away from a topic or or uh, a skill just because you're not an expert in, in it. Like you definitely don't need to be. Uh, and lastly, just building your skills and capacity over time. Which is basically what I was just saying, but as you're, you know, continue on this journey, just like scheduling in time to continue to, you know, you hear your kids are interested in audio production, see if you can find like an audio production um, platform like Soundtrap or, or oh, Seesaw, you know, play around with that. Uh, if they're interested in coding, do a couple of projects um, just so that you can show them to your kids and you can be able to provide them some support. 
uh, support, uh, providing support on that tool. But like, once again, you know, it's a journey and definitely don't feel like you have to be a, you know, full stack engineer to be able to expose your uh, kids to coding in meaningful ways. Um, yeah, so definitely appreciate the time and we'll be around to answer any questions. Thank you, Jacob. That was so inspiring to hear about all those projects um, and see how your programs equip students to make the world a better place. Like I'm amazed the PPE coding robots, the hand washing sta stations, truly amazing. Um, as we know, Computer uh, Education Week, Computer Science Education Week is next week. And um, this provides a perfect opportunity to put some of these ideas into practice and to inspire your students to really take an entrance in computer science. So um, we have a few resources uh, to help you out with that. So in the Seesaw Library, you'll find free computer science lessons that you can use in your classroom next week. So these lessons are ready to go and easy to use. You don't have to be an expert, just like Jacob said, um, to get your students started. We have all the resources included in all of these uh, lessons with you. So we are also going to share a computer science scope um, in sequence with some ideas for how to make the most out of computer science week. So I'm actually right now going to share my screen and I'm going to jump into my actual Seesaw account. And I am going to show you uh, how you can access all of these computer science collections that we have to offer. So here I am in my Seesaw account. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to tap that little library button. You can find that at the very top of your Seesaw journal next to the messages button. And once you tap on that library tab, then you're going to scroll down to the computer science tile. This is the, that green one here with the little gears there. So once you get to that tile, you're just gonna tap on it. And then you're gonna see here all of our computer science collections. So you see, we have a variety of collections here that range in topic from digital uh, leadership, um, computational thinking, coding um, for um, our youngest learners, K through two and for third through uh, fifth grade as well. Um, we have collections on visual data talks, which uh, teach students how to analyze data within real world context. And we have STEAM uh, collections, design thinking, and uh, computer science collections on careers in CS as well. So in order to view all of the lessons within a specific collection, all you have to do is tap on that blue view all lessons button. I am going to go ahead and jump into this STEAM design thinking collection collection. STEAM design thinking um, includes instructional videos that teach students about the topics that they are going to uh, help solve a real world problem um, with real world examples. There are several options available within each lesson. You can see here there are a number of different lessons on um, first that talk about the basics of design thinking and then actually getting students to jump in and solve a problem. So I'm actually going to jump into a um, one of these lessons. I'm going to jump into the very first one, the design um, thinking lesson here. And so we have um, these include um, an introduction video um, to introduce your students to the topic um, of that specific lesson. You do have the option to present that to the class whole group. You can play this with your students and then um, also um, included in this specific lesson um, are questions, discussion questions that you can engage your students in. You'll notice that all of this is in the Seesaw platform. So you can see you have all of the Seesaw tools here that you can use um, to model and demo um, along with your students um, how to use those tools while they're engaged in that um, discussion. And so after there um, is a follow-up activity, so this one has a connect activity in this introduction. However, um, there may be um, more than one here. You can flexibly assign these activities to your students um, to complete, and then they just respond using those creative tools. 
else. One thing that you will notice is that, as I mentioned, you don't have to be an expert um, in uh, um, design thinking or computer science. We have everything that you need uh, within these lessons to support you in implementing them successfully in your classroom. So one thing that um, is included in all of these lessons is a lesson plan. So you can see here is the lesson plan for this specific lesson. And the lesson plan just includes uh, your teacher objective and student I will statements. It also includes the standards that the lesson addresses any resources um, such as materials that you may need to use to complete the lesson, um, and also um, instructional format that the lesson is best recommended for. So you can see here, this lesson is recommended to be presented to the whole group, um, as well as with partners. Um, you'll notice uh, that as you go through these lessons that they can be used in several different um, instructional routines. Um, so it really gives you the flexibility to incorporate uh, these lessons into your day-to-day. Uh, the lesson plan also includes teacher tips uh, for teaching the lesson, and then it goes through an outline of step-by-step -step and um, instructions on how to teach with a breakdown of about how long each one of those sessions, um, lessons within the activity will take. So I'm just going to tap back over here to the design thinking, and I just want to click into just another, um, actually, I want to show you a couple other things. Um, so I'm going to click into uh, the second um, of the lessons or the second half of the lessons here. So you can see the difference. So the first lesson was an introduction. It was more condensed. You can see here that this lesson, after students have learned about the design thinking process, you can see these lessons are a bit more comprehensive here and a bit more involved. It still includes that introduction, which you will present to the whole class, but there are several um, activities here or several options available within the lesson to really practice that design uh, thinking process. So you as a teacher can pick one. Um, you can see there are three options here, or you can do all three. Each challenge follows the same series of steps and allows for exploration across many subjects, including science, technology, um, engineering, art, math, all of those esteemed subjects here. So I am going to go back and I want to highlight one more resource that we have for you. So if I tap back on computer science again, here are all of uh, those computer science collections. I'm going to go back into that STEAM design thinking by tapping that view all lessons. And you'll also notice that there is a tab that says jump to implementation resources. And when I do that, it is going to take you to the teacher implementation guide for that collection. So we do have implementation guides for all of our uh, CS collections. And the implementation guide really just helps you get started uh, teaching the lessons in the classroom. It also includes those best practices, as you can see here um, for presenting the material, for incorporating them throughout your day. So as I mentioned, everything that you need to be successful and everything that your students need to be successful um, are included in the lessons. So each computer science lesson is um, aligned to uh, the CSTA, the Computer Science Teaching Association standards, and they do support equitable STEAM instructions. Uh, the lessons are cross-curricular. They mix both hands-on and digital learning, and they really help uh, students make those connections between computer science uh, themselves and the world around them. We do um, want to make it easier uh, for students to get started with uh, students to start to really make those positive personal connections to STEAM and computer science. So we are excited to share that we are hosting three virtual field trips. Um, on each field trip, uh, we'll be joined by people who uh, use computer science in their jobs in a variety of ways. So on December 7th, um, two of our Seesaw engineers will share how they write code to make Seesaw work. On December 9th, we'll have actually two events. So the first event, we'll, um, we'll talk with um, Evan Gannon, who is a senior programmer of creative technology, to learn how to use code to create fun and interactive experience with lights. Um, and then on December 9th, um, the second session, um, we'll also see how computer science is used to create animations and art. Um, 
our Rainbow Seesaw's Rainbow Bear will be joining us um, along with our production team at Seesaw. I see some people in the chat saying they cannot join. That's okay. Register anyway. We will be sharing out the link to the recording afterwards, which you can play um, for your students after. So um, we hope that you can join us for those um, virtual events with your students, at least one of them, or um, sign up to get the recording. So as we close uh, today, I would love to take a moment to reflect um, on the session today. Uh, why is computer science important? Uh, go ahead and uh, put your responses in the chat. Why is it important? Why um, should we you know, give our students these experiences? Why should we teach it? I know you have a lot on your plate. So really, you know, want to hear from you why, um, what you learned about the importance of computer science. So we just dropped in the chat the link for you to register for those student events um, if you are able to make it or if you want to sign up for the recording. So computer science, Robin said, is the future. You're absolutely right. Yes. Um, and Ellen, yes, we have no idea what the future holds. We don't know what careers will look like in the future, um, but we have the technology and the problem solving. Um, we know that technology and problem solving will be a part of it. Um, so really equipping our students with those skills <clears throat> so that they can apply those to those careers in the future. Thank you so much for sharing. I saw another person in the chat say they came in a little bit late. No worries. This session is being recorded. So we will be sharing um, a link to the recording following the session in an email um, in about 24 to 48 hours um, with the recording. So you can go back and listen to the beginning of the session, um, as well as all of the resources that we shared. So computer science is really about giving our students the skills that they need to solve the challenges that are important to them um, and their futures. Equity in computer science means creating opportunities and conditions where everyone can participate and contribute to make an impact on their lives and in their community. So I want to thank all of you for joining us. And I want to thank Jacob for sharing uh, his expertise on how we can enable students to solve problems um, of our world with computer science. Um, we would love before we go, we do have a couple more minutes. So Jacob is going to come back on and join us. And we are going to take some of your questions. So if you have not put a question yet in the Q&A, go ahead and do that now. So let's see. All right, so we do have a question. What advice do you have for teachers for Computer Science Week, Jacob? Uh, yeah, for sure. I would say this could be like a really good opportunity to kind of like do a little test and see what your kids are interested in. And then if you don't already know, and then seeing um, how you can pair that with computer science uh, after the after this week, so, or, you know, after next week. Um, so that could be, a week where you maybe for like the freedom dream activity, you have them like create and code a story uh, of the world they want to live in. Uh, or you could have them like code and create some type of uh, like identity collage. Maybe they could do that um, through some type of a computer science lesson. And then from there, you could use that info and kind of build on that to create, keep creating like projects and lessons that where kids can see how coding can be used um, in conjunction with, um, you know, like social justice. I love that. That's the perfect opportunity to test it out, to try to, you know, get students interest and ideas. And then, like you said, take it from there. If there are any other questions, you can um, drop those in the Q&A tab. Looks like we might have answered all of the questions that we have today. So um, we would love if there are any more questions. We do have a couple minutes. We can come back to those. Um, however, we would love to get your feedback. 
your feedback is really valuable to us. We welcome it. Um, so um, we would love for you to share uh, your feedback. We're going to drop a link to a feedback form in the chat. Um, and it's also going to pop up when the webinar ends. Um, we rely on this feedback to bring sessions like this to you, to make our sessions better, um, to bring you exactly um, topics and experts that you really want to hear from and to bring you the best uh, trainings possible. So um, make sure that you go ahead and you complete that survey. Um, also, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And Jacob, thank you again for joining us as well. Um, and we hope that you have an amazing computer science education week. We hope you join us for our Seesaw field trips, you and your students. And see you soon here at Seesaw. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day.